As you know, today we are really pleased to have a, a very special guest today with us, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hammond. And Dr. Hammond is an alum of the University of Utah. She actually did her undergraduate and medical degrees here and an internship. And then after that went to the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm for a one-year NIH postdoctoral fellowship. And we'll ask her a little bit about that uh, to work with George Klein uh, before coming back to the U.S. and doing her Oh, it's okay, I'll just talk loudly. Doing her, you guys can hear me, right? Uh, and doing her um, residency in anatomic pathology and immunopathology at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And she stayed there and served as an associate pathologist and assistant professor of pathology at the Harvard Medical School until 1977. And while there, she and her husband became the parents of three children. So right. Yeah. And then she came back here to Salt Lake City. All roads lead back to Salt Lake City. I just want you all to remember yeah. that. <laughs> um, where she uh, made a number of very, very important contributions um, in the Intermountain System, as well as being on our faculty here at the University of Utah. Um, among those include having developed the electron microscopy laboratory at LDS Hospital. Um, and having really uh, made huge contributions in the field of our understanding of transplants, car especially cardiac transplants, but yeah. transplant biology, transplant pathology in general. And um, she has a large number of recognitions, um, important national roles that she has played at the NIH, in the professional societies that she's been a part of. And um, here she has chaired her department at LDS Hospital. Um, she served on the board of Intermountain Healthcare, as well as the College of American Pathologists, and on a, a working board at the NCI as well. And just to kind of give you a sense of her national reputation, because I could go on for a long time with her resume and all the accomplishments, uh, just this year she was recognized by the College of American Pathologists as the first recipient of the Pathology Advancement Award. And so we're really, really pleased to have her here. She so, quote, in quotes, retired in <laughs> 2011, but we'll hear that she's um, still very active. She published uh, 190 manuscripts during her career, as well as three books, and um, continues that productivity. So we're just so delighted to have you here. Oh, Thank you very much. it's fun to be here. I enjoy, I'm very happy to be here. This is my school, and I, yeah. I was sitting in your position at one point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for quite so, a while. <laughs> actually, so just to, to give us a sense of how many of you all are first years? We, uh, good a lot first of year you. turnout, oh, second great. years? Great. Any third years or fourth years? Usually yeah. we don't have too many because they're, yeah, the they're on the Yeah, they're on the That's right. Yeah. But we I like remember. them young and influenceable. That's, that's a good. <laughs> that's good. So maybe you can just start by putting yourself back into their shoes in first and right. second year of medical school and what you were thinking about and what might have drawn you towards a career in pathology. Yeah. Well, when I, when I started medical school, I was, um, it was at a very different time in terms of the way people regarded women in medicine, for example. Uh, I was, uh, it was very hard for me to get into medical school being a woman, and uh, I sort of felt like I had a little black cloud following me around everywhere I went because people were paying attention to whether or not I deserved to be there. So, okay, so how many women were there in the class? Uh, in my class, it was a class of 50, and there were three women. Hmm. Uh, the, one of those women quit after one year because she really just could not tolerate the kind of uh, abuse that she was facing from faculty members and and people's attitudes about women. It was really a very difficult experience. Um, and uh, the other woman graduated with me and we got to transfer students. But the attitude about medical education then was a lot different than it is now. In our class, it was almost as if the school didn't care whether you graduated, they were there to kick you out if they possibly could. That was the feeling you had, whereas now, I think they have, I think that the, the, the s rules of the game have changed dramatically where they really want you to get through medical school and they want you to practice medicine and they want you to do a good job and they're going to help you every way they can. But just as an example of that, when I was a, a, a uh, second quarter freshman, 
I ruptured an, an ovarian cyst on my ovary and bled into my abdomen. I was taking aspirin a lot because I had an astigmatism and I'd get headaches in the afternoon. Nobody knew then that, play, that that inactivated your platelets. So I got blood in my belly. I had an exploratory, I had to have an exploratory laparotomy as an emergency procedure and have the blood evacuated. Wow. Um, that was right before midterms of the winter quarter. And the, the medical school responded to that by saying, well, then you have to, uh, be, you, you have to be removed from the class. Wow. And uh, they were going to, to kick me out of school. Uh, but fortunately, I had a class full of wonderful students who bonded, to, we really bonded together. And we really cared about each other. And my, my lab mates in anatomy um, looked at that and said, this is ridiculous. She's a really wonderful student. If we just take her homework to her, she'll be fine. So they brought me my homework in the hospital. And then they said, well, she can't take the, if she can't take the exam, she's going to be kicked out. So um, they said, well, can we take her exams to her and proctor those exams? We'll sit in the room while she does them and make sure she doesn't cheat and then we'll bring the test back. So that's what they did. I took biochemistry, histology, um, and anatomy finals uh, in my room, or midterms in my room. They made me come and take the practical exam, obviously, in anatomy, and I had to walk up three flights of stairs one week after surgery, which was not a very pleasant experience, but I did fine because of my classmates, not because of the attitude of the people in the dean's office at the time, which is really a big lesson about how things have changed. I mean, look, you're having this session here, and you have the dean of the medical school here, who's trying to help, help you see what kinds of think lessons you need to learn from people like me. I think that's really quite a stunning change. <laughs> and uh, then when I was a junior student, we had a transfer, a woman come in as a transfer student. She arrived pregnant, having had been trying for nine years to have a baby. She was pregnant, and they tried to uh, remove her from the class. But that year, I was the president of the class. Wow. <laughs> and I got the, all the students to sign a petition that we would do whatever work she had to be done if they would leave her in. We would take her rotations, we would do whatever was required, but no wow. way were they going to kick her out. So the, the dean uh, agreed to that and uh, she got to stay. Wow. So, so in, that, in that framework, I was not too worried about, I was worried about staying in. I wasn't worried about what I was going to do. I was worried about making it to the end of the fourth year. And uh, in my second year, I got married in the middle of the year. And um, so that added another kind of wrinkle to the whole process. My husband was an architecture student. He and I were totally, completely busy. And I found that when I was a third year that, I, that medicine was something that was extremely exciting to me. I found that I never wanted to go home, basically. I just wanted to be in the hospital all the time. I loved what I was doing. But I also sort of recognized by that experience that were I to keep having that attitude about medicine that I, my husband and I would probably never have any children and we would, we might, I might not have the best quality of life. So I started looking around for alternatives of something that I could do that would allow me to pursue my research interest, which had started when I was a pre-med student, um, and that would also provide me with the opportunity to, um, to have a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what, when pathology became very attractive to me. So when I was a senior medical student, I took an elective in pathology over at LDS Hospital because that's where the action was at the time. They had very good surgeons and they were, they were, the pathologists were very interesting people. And I spent three months over there doing a pathology rotation. And I found that it, that it was really exciting to be a pathologist because you got to study all the aspects of disease. There was a big opportunity to do research related to that, but that your, your life could be much more regular and therefore I could have the possibility of eventually having children. I was terrified to have any children until I got to a point in my career where somebody would not kick me out for doing it. 
I mean, I was, that was my major thing at that point, so I certainly wasn't going to have any children then. Just to show you what a marked difference there has been in this program. Then when I got to be a resident, um, I was the first pregnant resident in the pathology department of the Mass General Hospital. Dr. Castleman um, looked at me when I told him I was pregnant. He said, this is highly irregular. And I said, <laughs> Actually, certainly it's it is. not that unnatural. <laughs> I said, Dr. Castleman, all the guys have had babies. It's just I have to carry the baby. He said, well, that's right. And I said, I'll only take my annual leave. So I got two weeks off to have my first child. Luckily, I have a very wonderful mother who came flying back from Utah oh, to yes. Massachusetts and, and saved us. She stayed there for a month, and, um, and we got a, found a babysitter and did all the things we needed to do. So that's how I came to be a pathologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really timely that you're talking with this first year class because for the first time ever, I don't know if you know this, yeah. out of the 102 students, we actually have a majority of women. You do! That is fantastic! <laughs> Can yes! you believe it? <laughs> I love it! I love it! Come a long way, right? Oh, Come that's really, way. I mean, yeah. when, I, when I applied for medical school, I was required, I had, I had perfect grades, basically. I had only a B in badminton ever in college. <laughs> I should have had a D because I, I failed the skills test, but, but my partner and I uh, won the intramural badminton championship, so they couldn't really give me a D. I was good at playing the game. I was just not good at the skills. Um, and, uh, so, they, but, uh, so I had perfect grades. I had really good scores on the MCAT. By, by, I should have gotten in with one interview, basically, but they made me have three. The third interview was with the head of the psychiatry department <laughs> who told me that I was taking the place of a man in the class. Did I realize that just because I was smart was not a good reason for me to want to be a doctor, that this was a serious responsibility, wow. yada, yada, yada. Did I ever intend to get married? Did I ever intend to have children? That would definitely not be a good idea. And I was already in love with my husband and fully planning to get married and have children, but I didn't answer the question directly. I just <laughs> smiled at him sweetly and said over and over again, Dr. Bliss, I intend to practice medicine my entire life. Dr. Bliss, I intend to practice medicine my entire life. And now I wish Dr. Bliss was still alive <laughs> because I could tell him I practice medicine my entire life. <laughs> and what's more, I'm really glad I did. You know, one of, the things that, one of the things that I think maybe students may or may not appreciate, because this, this is something that pathologists and radiologists, which I am, yeah, share in yeah. common, is the importance of uh, our role as educators. Yes. And I've heard you speak a little bit about that yeah. in, um, uh, on a video clip once that I saw. Yeah. So I wonder if maybe you can talk a little bit about that, because when I was a um, medical student, I actually, I will tell you that I swore that I would never become a pathologist yeah. or a radiologist yeah. because it was so boring. Yeah. And because when, and pathology, I actually, yeah. honestly, when, when the, um, professor was driving the, the microscope, the multi-headed mm -hmm. microscope, I always felt a little queasy because, you know, oh, yeah. all these cells would be moving around and I thought, oh, yeah. I can't do this for a living. But I hadn't fully appreciated just how important the education role is. And maybe you can talk about right. that because I think it's really gratifying. Yeah, that's, that's you know, I was always interested in being an educator. I, I love to explain things to people and I really wanted to do something with medical education. Um, and so, in, uh, uh, pathology is a natural field for that because it basically forms the basis of all medicine. It's the understanding of disease. So you get to be, you get to spend your whole life figuring out how to put the pieces of a puzzle together appropriately and find the answer for a patient or for groups of patients. And so as a pathologist now, I have the opportunity of helping other clinicians and residents and students understand the basis of disease. What, what causes these diseases? What are those diseases going to do to the patient? How can I really better understand what the patient's telling me because I understand biologically what's going on with the patient? And because, uh, because of that, and, and medicine is always changing, and so pathologists get to be at the forefront of that. We have to learn, I had to learn about molecular medicine after I was a fully fledged uh, 
pathologist. I mean, we didn't have uh, molecular medicine that didn't exist when I was in medical school. I had to learn it myself. But that's fun. So you get to learn your whole life, and, and the best way you can learn anything is by teaching other people about it. So when I give a lecture about something, I learn much more about it than I did when I was a student. In fact, you guys, if you taught each other the subject matter of your classes, you would really learn a lot. Mm. A lot more about it, because if you have to explain it to someone else, you really have to know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So yes, pathology is really a very great basis for anything. The year after I, my sophomore year in, in medical school, I needed a job. My husband and I had no money. I bet that sounds familiar. And so, we, uh, so I got a job doing autopsies because it was the highest paying summer job that I could get. And I didn't want to do it, but I felt like I had to because it was, it was good money. And, um, but then I found out when I did autopsies that I actually found out what was wrong with people that I could understand the entire course of their disease and how their symptoms uh, occurred and why they died in a way that uh, you never would without doing that. It was, it was really fascinating to me. And I recognized uh, the value of that when I was a junior student then because I realized that I knew more about some diseases, those people who I'd autopsied, than anybody in the room. Mm -hmm. I had a real understanding, I had a visual of that patient, what happened to them, their chart, what I learned. I looked at the whole story. It was really, really fascinating. So autopsies are a very good way to learn. I'm very sorry that we don't do more of them anymore. It's really too bad that it's become uh, so unpopular to do autopsies. They require a lot of time and energy and uh, they're expensive and I think that's one of the reasons yeah. they've fallen into disfavor. Well, we a lot. Yeah. yeah. Do you think patho so pathologists are always <coughs> the gold standard, right? So whenever right. we don't know right. clinically what's going on with someone, it's always whatever the pathologists say right. is true. But, you know, what does that actually mean? Do you think that, that there must be, and certainly in radiology, often we're the truth short yeah. of a biopsy. Right. And yet, as a radiologist, I know that we don't always know. No. It's not always clear. Right. And, and even just inter physician variances tell you that, that right. there is no absolute right. truth. So what, what is it like as a pathologist in terms of having that responsibility of, of that's, being the that's gold standard? The, that's the big responsibility you have. Pathologists don't get paid for making a differential diagnosis. They get paid for making an answer. So you have to come up with some answer. And in order to compensate for the uncertainty that Vivian's talking about, you have to, you couch the words you use in terms of how certain you are about the diagnosis. Um, that's one of the places where I've been spending quite a bit of my time recently is trying to help pathologists be more precise about their reporting. Because you can understand that if, that basically what I, as a pathologist, I deal in information. I'm providing information to people. And the, if my language is not very precise about that information, I can mislead the doctor and tell them, yes, this patient has cancer when I'm just saying, I think the patient has cancer. That's not the same thing, is it? So you need to, you need, the words that you use have to also have some expression of certainty. And that's also true in radiology. You have to put some expression, some descriptors in there that say, I think it's this, but it might be this, or uh, it's likely to be this, or it's highly probable, or it. Uh, so uh, in, in the pathology organization, I've been working with them to try to help us be more precise about the descriptors we use in those terms so that we won't end up confusing doctors and causing them to do the wrong thing. That's one of the key um, problems we have with being the, the sort of gold standard is you need to be, you need to get it right. And you also need to, that if you have five people doing the same job, you need to make sure that they're all doing it the same way. Because the doctor has to have some belief that, that if he hears from pathologist A or pathologist B or pathologist C, he's gonna get the same answer if the diagnosis is really certain. If it's cancer, you'd like to know that 95% that of the time all these pathologists would come up with the same answer. Unfortunately, that's not true because there's difference in skill. 
And that's where education comes in. Pathologists have to educate each other about the criteria for how you come up with an answer and what, what constitutes that level of certainty. It becomes mm -hmm. really, really critical. Mm -hmm. Tell us about, you talked about the evolution of pathology <coughs> into molecular. Yes. Uh, so, and you've been involved a lot in the HER2 guidelines. Right. For breast cancer. So right. maybe you can tell us a little bit about how that scientific advance is now translated into yes. clinical care. Right. It's a really great story. It is a great story. In the mid 80s, um, it was found that there was a cell surface protein uh, called HER2, um, a, a receptor protein, so it's expressed only on the surface of a cell, that uh, was found in greater abundance in, in about 20% of people with breast cancer. And those people that had this expressed, overexpressed receptor protein um, were much more likely to die of their breast cancer. They were much in much worse shape than everybody else. So if you told the patient that they had this expression, you were giving them a death sentence, basically. They're gonna die, and their chances that they are die, would die were much higher than other breast cancer patients. So this was a very scary and bad situation. In the 90s, uh, some research was done to see if you could produce an antibody against that protein so you could have a drug, a targeted drug, that would actually target those patients who had that proper, that specific protein on their cells. And if you could target a drug directly to that protein, you could do something to uh, kill those cells and therefore help those patients. So that, was, uh, be, that work was begun in the 1990s, and in fact, by the late 90s, they had a drug which could do that. It was called Herceptin. Trastuzumab is its real name, but tra Herceptin was the name that it was given. And a test was generated to help <coughs> you find that protein, which is the expression of the increased number of HER2 genes in the cell. So it's a molecular test. There were increased HER2 genes in the cell, which caused increased protein expression on the surface. And, the pro and, the, and this antibody was a drug that was made to target that protein. Now, the only people who respond to that drug are people who actually have the protein on their surface and or have the gene inside their cell. So the gene codes for the protein and then the protein is, is hit by the drug, right? That's a nice little sequence of events. The only problem is you've got to make sure that you can identify that the gene is actually amplified. There are increased copies, or you have to identify that there really is extra protein on the cell, and then in order for that patient to respond. So a, a test was made to help you find the, the genes or help you find the protein. Those are two ways that, that the genetic test could be performed, right? And, and, and in those cases, the patient would respond. <clears throat> the original clinical trials were done just looking for the protein, um, and um, they showed that people who had that protein, more than 50% of them would respond, and their cancer would be killed, and they would be saved. So this was a really important story, right? The problem is, is that um, after a few years of these clinical trials, they found out that the tests that they were doing to, to find this out were wrong about 20% of the time. So one in five women who had the test performed by a, a pathologist in a pathology laboratory mm -hmm. would be told that they had a HER2 positive tumor when it wasn't true. Or they would be told they had a HER2 negative tumor when it wasn't true. If you're HER2 positive, if you're not HER2 positive and you get this drug, then you will pay $100,000 for this treatment your cancer won't respond, it'll still grow, and you have about an 8 to 15% mm. chance of developing heart failure. So this is not a happy story, right? And if you're negative, you won't be offered the drug, and so you'll probably die of your cancer if you're really HER2 positive and the pathologist said it wasn't true. So just think about the power and the responsibility that is present in those pathologists. It was really pretty extreme. 
And I, I, when the papers came out that showed that there was this error rate, I, was, I became very, very concerned. I'm an immunopathologist. I understand these tests and I know how likely it is that you can do them wrong if you play around with the recipe in the inappropriate way. So I, I understood the basis for the problem and so I started trying to teach pathologists how to change that. It was very unsuccessful. I'd get mm. 60 people in a room, I'd, tell, I'd use my best manner to teach them and they would, nothing would happen. Why, so, why? why would nothing happen? Because they perceived that, that what I was telling them wasn't that, wasn't, uh, didn't apply to them. They, they were doing knew it so perfectly. much, they were mm -hmm. doing it perfectly, it uh -huh. was someone else's problem. Okay. So I got clinicians to come in the room with me, uh, Dr. Dan Hayes, who was a breast cancer oncologist, and the two of us sat there together and started telling them, and they started to get the idea that this might be a serious problem. But we could see that we weren't impacting people enough by just telling them the facts, that we needed to have some power, some, some teeth in our argument. So Dan was part of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, I was a board member of the College of American Pathologists, so we had a pathologist and a cancer doctor who were both in positions of, of, of influence in organizations. We decided we would get those organizations to agree to work together to create a document that said, here's the recipe you must use, and then publicize that that recipe was what needed to be done. Now, in order to, to write a document like that, what you have to do is know that the evidence, you have to know the evidence. And so we had to spend a lot of time looking at the medical literature, assessing the evidence to see what was the best way to do it. How should you do the, ampli the test for those genes? How should you look for that protein? And how can you avoid the pitfalls? And so we uh, sat together for about a year. We wrote a guideline document in 2007. It was published under both organizations in both our publications, and then we publicized that. And that made a complete switch in the interest of the pathologists and mm -hmm. other people mm -hmm. about what to do. Mm -hmm. They started doing the right things. It, it's not perfect, but it's certainly a lot better than me talking to them 60 at a time. So uh, the reason why I've spent some effort telling you about these details is that for every molecular test, the same problem exists. Mm -hmm. You have to do the test properly or else you'll give people the wrong answer. And just because it's molecular doesn't mean that it's any different than a, a blood glucose test. If it's, if it's wrong, you're gonna cause harm. You need to make sure the test is correct, okay? For, for molecular tests, now we have a variety of ways of doing these tests. And uh, some of the more, the, the new ways of doing it are to take uh, the genetic material and do a whole sequence, either a targeted sequence of a tumor or a sequence of the patient's entire genome and spit out information about all the genes that are present. The problem with that kind of method is that the way in which the analysis is done is very uh, different depending upon the laboratory yeah. in which it is performed. Yeah. So if it's done at Stanford versus MD Anderson, they don't use the same uh, algorithm to generate the data and the data won't necessarily come out the same way. So the, the problems that I sh told you about with protein expression or gene amplification are the same problems we're gonna have with these new tests. We have to find out where the pitfalls are. We have to come up with standardized analysis methods and good controls so that we can make sure the tests are accurate before we believe them. Well, as providers or people who are ordering yeah. these tests, are there any ways in which we can assess whether our pathologists are using the, are following the, the recommended the guideline? guidelines? I mean, do yeah, we you have any? ask the question. You can they ask have the question. to. Well, you can ask the question: yeah. Are you following the guideline or not? Are you doing the proficiency testing? Is your lab inspected it and accredited? Mm -hmm. Which is what we mm -hmm. the teeth we build into it is. Mm -hmm. We said you must monitor your lab performance four times a year and pass, and you must have your lab inspected every two years mm -hmm. and pass. And the the what those inspectors do? They go in and say. 
are you doing these things that are in that guideline document? Right. In the last, we, we revised the guideline just this year, 2013, and I was on a bunch of radio interviews for a morning uh, talking to random people about this, and the question they always asked me was, if I'm a patient, what should I ask my doctor about HER2 testing? Mm -hmm. So I told them, ask your doctor if the laboratory that's doing the test is following the guideline or not. And if they're not following the guideline, get the test done somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We don't have the luxury of being cowboys anymore, of just doing whatever we want. We have to do things in a standardized way. Do you think increasingly that we Critical. will be held to that standard yes. in terms of the way in which we're paid? Because I would, I would make the case maybe the labs yes. that aren't following the guidelines shouldn't, shouldn't get be reimbursed. Paid. No, no, they shouldn't. Well, see, if you, do, if you don't pass accreditation, Medicare will not pay you. Right. Um, so that's why some labs don't want to be accredited. When we started this process, there were only two labs, 20, no, sorry, 200 labs who were doing this kind of monitoring of themselves on, on purpose. Yeah. Now that number's up to 900, and we think there's maybe only 1,100 labs who are doing it. So we, we've You're changed getting, this yeah, a lot. Yeah. And it's going to have to happen with next generation sequencing yeah, yeah. Um, for <coughs> all kinds of RNA expression array tests. All those things have to have the same level of rigor. So the first question to ask in any situation is, you know, is that laboratory following standards? Yeah. Do you know that they're following standards? Do they have a piece of paper on the wall that say they're accredited, they're doing proficiency yeah. testing, they have, uh, and they've been able to do this for a long period of time? Yeah. And if the answer is not true, no, is no, then I wouldn't, I would run away from that laboratory very quickly make the same plug for imaging while we're on this Absolutely. topic because people think one MRI scanner is the same as another and they'll go to some community imaging center and right. you get these pictures and they're like Rorschach tests you know right. oh, I see something there and because they can get reimbursed and paid the same amount right. kind of like in pathology um, it's really up to us as the people who are ordering right. the test to be sure that you're ordering a quality right. study it's the really radiologists important. have done a lot with standardization right for um, that very reason, oh, the same reason. Amazing. But it's even more important in pathology yeah. in many ways. So, so. We, we started in the early 90s. It turned out that cancers were not being examined the same way. And so we started in the early 90s with the College of American Pathologists to actually set some standards about how you should examine a breast. How do you decide if you've examined the test, the breast, the piece of tissue properly? How many lymph nodes do you have to find? How do you assess the mm. margins? How many sections do you take? So you all need to sort of think about, uh, I mean, the, the criticism that I get uh, generated in, or in discussions with pathologists is, well, you're telling me what to do. You know, I'm a doctor. You're not supposed to, this is cookbook medicine you're talking about. I'm saying, no, I'm talking about the floor. I'm not talking about the ceiling. This is the minimum standard that you have to comply with. What happens after that is still under <coughs> discussion, but we're talking about the floor, not the ceiling. And all of you need to know there is a floor, just like Vivian's saying in radiology. There's a floor, there's a standard below which you should not go. And, um, and so you need, to, you need to feel obligated to find out that those standards are being met. They're happening in every part of medicine. In fact, now we have pay for performance measures that are generated. Uh, the, the cancer protocols, these standards that the College of American Pathologists came up with are now being used as pay for performance measures in pathology. So if pathologists don't examine, they don't find at least 12 lymph nodes in a colon, they don't find at least 12 lymph nodes in a breast, then they're considered to be in, have done an inadequate examination, and therefore they don't get, shouldn't get paid. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's quite gone to that point, but it will. Can you just, I, I want to ask you one last question that yeah. I want the students to ask yeah. you questions, but y you've really uh, made huge contributions in, in research throughout your career. Maybe you could talk a little bit about balancing the practice of medicine yeah. with research right. and, and how that can be a, kind of a, a mutually productive yeah. kind of interaction. Well, I, I mean, you're getting the, the, you're getting the opinion of one individual, remember but one individual who loves research 
I have loved research ever since I was in pre-med because I would have a question and I'd want to know the answer. How do you find the answer to any question that you don't know the answer and you can't find it in a book? You got to do experiments. You have to use the scientific method to find the answer. And if you construct your questions properly, you can probably find the answer or you could work with somebody who has the tools to make it so you can. Well, what's the impact of that on clinical medicine? Um, that is how we make all the progress we make. Look at the HER2 story I told you. What if nobody had tried to take that protein and make a drug directed against it? Would those patients be saved today? No. Um, what if people had not tried to change those tests to make them more effective, better? Then patients would suffer from that, right? And so the changes that we, uh, all, all of the imaging, when I was in medical school, there was no imaging. <coughs> now there's imaging. You could, I remember the first time I saw the uh, uh, a CAT scan of the brain, I was just blown away. It was when I was at the Mass General. I thought, you can actually see the brain. This is amazing. It's not just a shadow with a skull with nothing in there. It's, it's actually an organ that you can actually understand. And radiologists understand neuroanatomy in a way that no one else does because they can now have these tools. Well, how are those tools developed? Research. Somebody ask a question. Is there a way I can use a different technology to get to a different answer? And they did. And then they got an answer and they worked farther and it became a, a commercial test and uh, now we're all benefiting from it. So research is the way questions get answered and clinical medicine gets changed. If you are not a person who wants to do that research yourself, that's fine. A lot of people do not. But don't be, uh, don't be too quick to, uh, to think that those people who are doing that are not making a serious contribution. Um, I, I remember that there were people in, in management in Intermountain who used to say to me, but these are just science projects. Whereupon I would give them a, a list of all the things that had changed in medicine because of the science projects. So even if you're not a person who wants to do it yourself, support those that do. Try to find the patients for them. Try to help them accomplish that because your, you and your patients will benefit from it in the long run, big time. Mm -hmm. There's a role for everyone. There's a role for everyone, and, but it's not the same role. Luckily, we don't all like the same things. I mean, and that's good because otherwise we'd all be doing one thing and not anything else. And I'm, I'm happy that I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd like to see if, uh, students, do you guys have any questions? You look at the documents. Uh, the accreditation of laboratories is very, very, is a very, very detailed process. One of the things I'm most proud of about the pathology community is that up to about the 19, late 1950s, laboratories did just what you said. They said, I'm doing a great job. And I can show you papers that I have procedures and da, 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 and I'm doing a great job. But they didn't have any controls necessarily, or maybe they weren't using them. Uh, they weren't maybe not using their equipment properly. After all, it was just the pathologist who was telling you that. How did you know that was true? So in, in about the 1950s, the College of American Pathologists, path, the pathologists in that organization said, you know what, we ought to develop a peer-reviewed process where I go in your lab and you go in mine and I act, I look at what you're doing and see if you're doing it right or not. So that peer-reviewed process started in the 1950s and it dramatically improved the quality of laboratory testing and has proceeded ever since. So the, that organization does it. It's a peer-reviewed process. If I'm a pathologist running a lab, I'm obligated to go and inspect other labs. And, but there's a very clear uh, laundry list of things I have to do and I can't just look at their documents or talk to them. I go talk to the head of the hospital and say, what do you think about these pathologists? Are they doing a good job? I talk to the, uh, so the head administrator, the head physician, 
Then I go and look at their slides. I talk to the technicians in the laboratory. I open refrigerator doors and see if there's mold and spaghetti in there instead of samples. I, I believe me, that happens, unfortunately. <laughs> It does happen. I want to know who eats that spaghetti. That's <laughs> yeah. what I want to know. <laughs> well, there, sometimes people just don't have a right attitude about these kind of things. So, so you have to go, it's boots on the ground is the answer. You tell by boots on the ground. There's no other way. Do you think one day, though, it'll be publicly available online, you know, that you can actually look and see which, yes. organ, which hospitals have accreditation uh, in all those areas? The College of American Pathologists has resisted publishing that list, mm -hmm. but they shouldn't it's be allowed to not do right. it. It's it, ha it should be public information. I mean, you can, but you can, as a, as a doctor or as a patient, go to the laboratory director and say, show me your accreditation. They have a piece of paper, and it says when they were accredited and when it expires. <laughs> and it can be done by them, can be done by the Joint Commission, or it can be done by a state inspecting society. Uh, the Joint Commission is very good at inspecting hospitals, but they're very poor at inspecting laboratories. Mm -hmm. They really are. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can walk circles around them if you're a pathologist and you know what you're doing because they send people that don't know anything about the laboratory. So mm -hmm. the level of the inspection is much, it's much worse. It's better to have the college do it. For one thing, pathology is such a broad field because it includes all disease that I've never done the same job for very many years, which is why it's so exciting. So any time a job became boring to me, I could change my job. I could develop a new test and put it in my laboratory. Um, or I could decide I wanted to be the head of a different section of the lab. So I could go from, um, so if you're in charge of a laboratory, there are two parts to pathology. One is anatomic pathology, where you look at pieces of people, breast cancer samples, um, uh, any kind of a piece of tissue that you could look at under a microscope, or do a genetic test on, or do an antibody test on. That's anatomic pathology. And then there's the clinical pathology, it's called, or what you do is manage a laboratory. If I'm a clinical pathologist, I'm responsible, say, for microbiology. And what I do in my day is I go in and make sure that the technicians are doing their work properly. I might have to deal with problems that they have or answer questions about a bad inspection that we had. But mostly what I do is talk on the phone to doctors who are calling me up and confused about this patient has an infection and you say it's responsive to this drug and it isn't. Now what do I do? You know, or I don't understand what that organism is that you said. I've never heard of that before. What is that organism and what does it mean? So that's what the clinical laboratory pathologists do. And they run blood banks so they keep people alive who get transfusions. Um, so you're kind of managers, really, you're right? Managers. Most of the day-to-day -day work is actually done by your the technicians. Techs, right. right. What you do is you're the doctor's doctor. You're the encyclopedia. If you have a question, especially if you're in a, a, a facility where there's, you're, a, you're, a, you're a primary care doctor, your best source of information is to call the pathologist and say, I have this patient. What, what test should I do on this patient to figure out what thyroid disease they have? I know that the patient has thyroid disease, but I really am confused about, you've got 10 tests on there. Which test should I use? Which one is the best? Do I need a molecular test for this diagnosis or not? It's going to cost $2,000. Do I need to pay that $2,000? So no two days are ever the same. It's just wonderful. Um, <laughs> and that's what the clinical lab guys do. In anatomic pathology, you look at slides. At least some pathologists look at slides all day long. I, don't, I have never done that um, because I like to develop new tests. So I got electron microscopy and immunocytochemistry done, and I was always developing a new test to do and then evaluating the data on that test to see if it was good and answering doctors questions about it going to meetings and saying this is why we're doing HER2 testing on your patient this is what it means and this is what you should do about it because the person who actually tells the doctor what to do for the patient is the pathologist they're the ones that are giving them the advice about what to do and uh, and they may or may not be doing it appropriately 
Then if you, so I have, I have been an online, I've been a, a line pathologist doing autopsies or surgical path. I've been a pathologist developing tests. I've been a pathologist running an entire laboratory where I used to say, every, the problem with coming to work is that I trip over rocks and I pick up the rock and I never know whether it's a garter snake or some poisonous snake that's gonna kill me in five minutes. <laughs> and that's what day, the day was. You were just answering questions for a year from your colleagues saying, why did the lab do this particular thing wrong? Why did that phlebotomist do that wrong? And then you have to go and solve their problems. So no two days are ever alike. It's a totally exciting and energizing experience. And you don't, do, or do you have emergencies very often? Or well, many pathologists? Well, in transplant you do. Okay, in transplant you do. You, don't, you do in the blood bank. And in the blood, the blood bank. The blood bank is a very, is a source of great emergencies. Right. And, um, and transplant, you a transplant course, is. Yeah, and then the also, biopsies. pathologists are called in to do emergency frozen sections, which are highly, uh, innervating because you, you uh, the worst example of that the one that I always had horrors about was I'm called in the middle of the night because they've done a biopsy of the pancreas now the pancreas is in a very bad location I think you guys probably even know now where the pancreas is right <laughs> it's in the back and you don't get to it very easily and it's just a bag of enzymes so it can digest everything around it if you open it up in the wrong way. So you can make the patient really sick from this. So they biopsy the pancreas and they come to you and say, does this patient just have an infection or do they have a cancer of the pancreas? Well, those things look very much alike. And on a frozen section, if it's not a good section, you might have a hard time figuring that out. And if it's the middle of the night, you might be there all by yourself. If you tell the doctor the patient has cancer, they're gonna whip out the pancreas and all the associated tissue, and that's a very major surgery that has a high mortality and morbidity rate. If you tell them they have an infection, they're not gonna do anything. And you get to decide which they do. You, all alone, in five minutes. That is not a very comfortable situation to be in. But luckily, you usually don't have to do it all alone. Even if it's the middle of the night, you could always call in a colleague or you can say, I can't tell. The best thing to learn about, the best, it, most important thing to learn in medicine is that there are situations where you don't know the answer and don't be afraid to say that. It's better to, do, to say I don't know than to cause harm. And I've done that before. I'm sorry, I can't tell whether this is infection or a tumor. You're gonna have to close the patient up and I'm gonna have to see the sections tomorrow and show it to other people and decide but the doctors don't like it if you do that very often. <laughs> However, I did practice medicine for a lot of years and nobody ran me out of town, so I must not have made too many mistakes. <laughs> That's a really important question and all of you are gonna face that in one way or another, mothers, fathers, whatever. We had our children when we were residents. When I was a resident, my husband was an architect um, and luckily we had the agreement before and the strong desire that we would make this experiment of, of a dual career family work. We would make it work and, and it wasn't just me going to make it work, it was us making it work. So my husband is as committed to our children as I am and he would do whatever was required. And so basically as we went along with busy episodes we had problems like in that day people got chicken pox and when you got chicken pox the kid had to stay home and you couldn't get anyone else to take care of the kid you had to do it so we just get up in the morning and say okay what do you have to do today what do you have to do today uh, who's going to have the more serious problem if you stay home and one of and we would decide uh, we arranged our schedule. I was the morning mommy and he was the, he was the morning mommy and I was the afternoon mommy. I could go to work as early in the morning as I wanted. If I had more to do, I just went earlier. If, uh, and he could stay as late as he wanted. But that limited the number of hours that our children were without their parents. Um, and so that was a decision we made. But all those things were priorities and decisions we made together. So we said, our kids really matter to us. We're gonna help them grow up properly. We're gonna put them as a very high priority in our life and we're gonna, 
we're going to put the other things aside if we have to to make that work. And uh, by setting those priorities in advance and by having a good uh, friendship and communication and goals as a family together, we were able to do it. It was not easy and there was a lot of pressure and aggravation associated with it. I mean, both of us gave up recreation of every kind, uh, friendships, social relationships, and personal time. And uh, if you ask me, though, if I would do it again, yes, I would. I'm happy to report that my children, none of them were ju juvenile delinquents. They still <laughs> speak to me. I have 11 grandchildren, which oh, is the wow. blessing of the world. Uh, they all love me. They, don't, they just know me as Mama. They don't have any idea what I do when I go off to this other place. They don't know what that is. I'm Mama, and I wear my Mama clothes, and we, we play in the playroom and cook things and go to the park. <laughs> so it's, it's a question of planning in advance and making sure that you marry the right person or that you and the person that you have already married, if you're already married, <laughs> make sure that you and the person, whoever it is, male or female, that the two of you have agreed in advance of the, of the pressure situation how you're going to handle these issues. How are you going to do that? I mean, the good part is I am now, uh, my children are grown up and they have children. Those, my children are as close to their father as they are to me. They would do anything to spend time with him because he was as much their parent as I was. We were in it together. And it could have been the other way around. It's not always the women that want to be the nurturing person. It can be either parent. But because we were both nurturing parents, we have a wonderful relationship with our children now. Mm. Our children had to be responsible, though, oh, highly yes. responsible, oh, yeah. and, and handle things on their own. Well, we're very lucky that you worked that out so that you could make all these other contributions <laughs> yeah. on the professional side. Yeah. And we want to thank you today well, for coming. Welcome. We have a token <laughs> gift. Yeah.